by design, and when I use the word design to quote or paraphrase a quote by Steve Jobs, I'm not talking about you know what it looks like, but more how it works. So just thinking about, you know, in this short presentation, I'm going to share some examples of the work that we at IBM are doing to address climate change, primarily led out of our research division, and hopefully along the way it starts to spark some ideas around what you can be doing and the ways that you can be working together to start to impact change in your local communities. There has never been a more exciting time to be alive and to be a creator. We have so much that we're able to work with in terms of access to data, access to open APIs, access to technology that can allow us to solve problems in ways we have never been able to do so before. And I particularly find it to be pretty exciting. Now, quickly just to orient, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that I do in my group. Um, and some of the philosophies that, that IBM has. Um, you know, at the heart of what we do, we really do believe that good design is good business. And when we think about design, we think about designing for the people that we serve. You know, and I know a lot of the theme of what we've been talking about today is starting with the why. What is the problem that we're solving? But then through applying design to problem solving, you can very quickly map to who we're helping and who we're solving for, and then how we might help, and then what the solution might be. thing I think coming from a big technology company is our philosophy is not technology to replace people it's technology to enhance the work that we as human beings are able to do so thinking about the way that we're able to apply things like big data um, AI machine learning to help people like doctors and scientists actually solve higher order questions so we're able to um, apply technology to the way that we progress by doing things very simply around um, pointing AI and machine learning at the ability to um, parse through reams of research, so millions of pages of research to get to insights, um, you know, scopes of uh, pages that would take a human being years to actually process and understand. We can now apply technology to taking a look at all of that information, find out insights in a minute, so then we have doctors and researchers can actually use their expertise across a number of, of areas, you know, strategic consulting, so helping big businesses think about setting up venture corporate uh, capital groups, creating designs and solutions for people, and then scaling those and managing. But importantly, I think we must get past this to really get at what's most interesting to talk about today, which is the work that we're doing around applying our capabilities to solve a big problem. Is that better? Yeah, yeah it's better. Much better. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so IBM has done quite a lot of work in the in the area of climate change, and we've actually won as an organization seven awards in uh, the Environmental Protection Agency's eight-year program. So in 2018, we earned our sixth Climate Leadership Award. We were the first and only company to actually achieve that in the time. And what that means is, uh, cutting to this year, we received our seventh award in the eight-year history related to the work that we're doing to reduce greenhouse emissions. Um, and we've actually achieved our personal CO2 emissions goal in four years less than what our target was, and we've we exceeded it. Um, our target was 35%, and we've actually reduced our carbon emissions. And we're also doing quite a lot of work with the United Nations, too, um, to think about how we can get to more sustainable development uh, across the world. One example of that is the work we're doing with um, the Plastics Bank to think about how we can apply technology to solving the plastic pollution pro uh, problem in our oceans. IBM Research is a really large division that over the course of our 100 plus year history has won five Nobel Prizes for the work we do around solving problems for people in the world that we live in. Can you, um, can you hold, hold oh, on? Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Sorry. Um, and, you know, I think we can all agree that climate change is a very real problem. Uh, the world is getting warmer. The mean ocean levels are rising at 25% more than they were in the 
20th century. And the scientists who are on the front line of actually addressing these problems face serious challenges, right? So starting with the why climate change, mapping to the who, scientists who are on the front line of solving these problems, some of the challenges that they face are around limited access to weather data, limited access to the computing power and the data storage required to be able to model and simulate the effects that climate change will have on our planet in order to inform the solutions that they might come up with. So understanding that problem and that human need that the scientists and researchers face, we started thinking about what we can do to help, which is really pointing some of the assets that we've got around providing access to computing power, um, providing access to data and data storage and big data analytics that actually allow the scientists to simulate and to come up with solutions for the work that we're doing. And we're putting real money behind it. So we've dedicated $200 million to support um, the work that, that the scientists are doing. And we actually created a solution called the World Community Grid that opens up computing power, uh, access to data, and, and, and that sort of thing to allow this important work to happen. We've also put together uh, a, a program called Call for Code. So in 2018, our CEO, Jenny Rometty, made a commitment to invest $30 million over five years to the Call for Code initiative, which is really pointed at engaging developers and technologists to harness their unique problem solving skills um, to go to bear against some of the real problems that we face in our community. So for example, um, last year, Call for Code was pointed at solving the you know, problems around the fires that broke out in Sonoma County. We also dedicated, because um, time and skill are one of our most valuable resources, um, a number of our people to actually work with the County of Sonoma to think about how they could improve their rapid response program uh, for the people in need in the county. Um, part of the way that this program works is, you know, we've opened up applications uh, to come from people with, who have great ideas to then get access to funding, so $200,000 for um, awarded submissions to actually put together their solutions, address climate change, and we've actually developed this in partnership with the UN. Another interesting uh, piece of work that we're doing is how we can actually put AI against solving problems like access to water. So this picture, taken not too long ago, June 2019, um, women filtering water at a dried up lake in Chennai, India. Um, and I think you know one of the things that our research scientists are really looking at is how we can actually point technology at solving problems like these for people in their communities. AI is a really important tool for environmental scientists and researchers. Um, and you know, and as creators yourselves, there's a lot of avenues to look for leveraging open APIs to then inform the work and the solutions that you're building. Um, and it's a really powerful tool for solving problems, especially when there's uncertainty. So for example, as you're starting to think about how you might come up with insight based on data to then come up with solutions for the, the challenges you might be solving, um, new technologies like AI and machine learning can be incredibly powerful. Another important, um, another important announcement too is thinking about the way that you can leverage technologies like blockchain. So who who here is familiar with the notion of blockchain? We hear it a lot. And in what industries are people applying blockchain most effectively? Finance. Finance. Any others? Real estate. Any others? You know, one thing we think quite a lot about is um, food and the supply chain related to food. So close to 50% of all of the food that is generated, farmed, and produced goes to waste. Um, we know world hunger is a, is a big challenging problem and about 50% of the food that is actually produced and farmed is lost just due to the chaotic nature of the supply chain. One thing that blockchain is really good at is providing transparency across an entire value ecosystem. So what I mean by that, simple language from farmer all the way through to families that buy the food. And 
And so we've been doing a lot of work to think about how we can apply a technology like blockchain to solving, to, to, to solving a problem like food shortages, looking at what the problem might be, supply chain, and then thinking about how we can store that information so that people all through the system can get smarter about farmers knowing exactly how much to plant. Food, uh, food suppliers like grocery stores understanding how much they should be ordering and then making sure that all of that gets safely and sustainably into the hands of the people who need it. Another area that we're focusing in on is how we can actually think about applying technology to solve the energy crisis and to look at how we can actually get to reductions and hopefully ultimately emissions of dependence on fossil fuel. Um, we really do believe that doing good for the environment equates to doing good for business. And we, you know, our or own organization has done quite a lot to think about how we can reduce the, uh, the amount of fuel that we're using. Um, I think we've reduced over 7.2 mil million megawatt hours of electricity since 1990. And we're applying the learnings that we've generated ourselves to how we can work with our clients to think about making those uh, making those impacts and making those changes. Um, and what's interesting coming from a company like this is, you know, clients include not only corporations, but also government entities. You know, I'm thinking about the people in the cities uh, that we serve. Um, I think an interesting example of that is the notion of smarter buildings. So we just heard about how many people are moving into cities. The increasing reliance on uh, major buildings and you know, if you think about it, the amount of electricity that these buildings use, the amount of energy that these buildings use, and the opportunities to actually um, reduce that demand on ener energy consumption. So we developed an entire initiative around smarter buildings, which actually translates also into smarter cities. Um, but I find this to be a pretty interesting example. Um, you know, we started, and this is an interesting way that you can start to think about the innovations that you do yourself and with your teams and your, and your partners and the people in your communities, you know, starting small, starting local, starting with purpose, and getting to rapid test, learn, and prototype. So, for example, the notion of smarter buildings started with one building on an IBM campus where we started to think about how we could leverage smart technology and AI to actually reduce the footprint of that building and the amount of energy that it consumed. Proved it out through rapid test and learn scaled it to over 15 campuses worldwide in 155 buildings, had significant impact, and now started to think about how we could scale globally to applying this smarter building technology to the cities that we work with, a lot of the clients that we work with, and that sort of thing. You know, another problem that we're starting to think about solving too is um, energy transition, so it's moving away from fossil fuel to more sustainable. Good goal, that's where we wanna to get to. The why is the climate is changing, we actually need to address it. And then getting to you know the what and the how gets pretty interesting and pretty complex. But if you, th if you break it down, you know the way that we're working through it is starting to think about how we could apply the tools that we have, um, data, technology, to how we can actually help governments plan for you know, the unpredicted governments, energy and utility companies, that sort of thing, plan for the shifts in supply and demand, um, starting to think about how we can apply data to more flexibility in the smart grids, especially as you start to make this move from traditional fossil fuels to solar and wind, which right now are pretty unpredictable. You know, how we can do things like apply the tools that we've got, big data and analytics, to making our smart grids more flexible so we can actually help plan for um, and manage shifting supply and demand with increasingly new and currently volatile uh, energy sources. And another really interesting example here is the work that we're doing with Hello Tractor. So Hello Tractor is an ag tech startup. Um, in, they're, they're working primarily in, in Africa and Asia. And this goes back to the notion that we heard about in the first talk around not thinking about how you can solve it yourself, but starting to think about how you can solve problems in partnership with other groups, companies, people, in your communities. So Hello, Hello Tractor is an agribusiness startup, and the reason they're in business, the why behind why they exist, is thinking about how they can support uh, farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. 
So, you know, 60, roughly 60% 60 of farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa um, operate manually. Less than 20% have access to machinery like tractors. Um, and many, on top of that, have incredibly limited access to the credit they need to get the supplies they need to actually do their job. Um, and due to poor planning, lose about 50% of their yield once they've actually managed to produce it. So it's a pretty compelling problem. There's a pretty strong why. Um, what Hello Tractor is actually working to do, oh, confounding this, the fact that the population in Africa is growing by you know 11 million plus annually. So we've got a huge compelling why to solve. Hello Tractor is actually working to develop a digital wallet, and they're working with IBM Research in Kenya to do this. A digital wallet that helps connect farmers to the machinery they need, to data and analytics that help, can help them plan for um, the farming and, and their crop management and yield, as well as to the financial services and support that they'll need to actually make all of this a reality. Um, Any questions on any of those, or thoughts on any of those ideas, or problems that are being solved? Yeah. For the uh, Hello Tractor, uh -huh. are you guys, or is IBM working with the farmers to create like more sustainable techniques to farm, like no-till farming? Because if you you're giving them access to these tractors and big machines, they might try and increase their yield to the maximum potential, which yeah. we were just talking about is yeah. usually the best. Yeah, a little bit a little bit of that. Especially um, learning how to how to think about it and plan for it and take advantages of data that can help them model and, and actually see and understand what that impact would be. Um, and a lot of the way that we work uh, too, it's it's very human centered. So as we're working with companies to solve these problems, as we're working with farmers to solve these problems, we spend a lot of time sitting with them individually to understand the problems that they have, the challenges, um, and help them understand also how they can take adva advantage of the capabilities that we're providing um, and the impacts that might have. Um, so you can think and plan a couple steps down. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? I'm going to end with two videos that actually bring to life some of the some of the work that we're doing. The second one, in my mind, is more interesting than the first. That's my opinion. You can tell me your thoughts. just mapping to starting with the why and then getting to the view. The first one was really, you know, uh, American Airlines thinking about how they can get some dynamic rebooking for people with their flights to cancel. Pretty straightforward. This is more interesting. This is actually looking across the, um, the country of Australia to how we can use technology and community involvement to think about understanding the ecosystem of biodiversity of frogs, which has a direct correlation to climate change.
<laughs> Were any of you able to actually hear that? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, what I find interesting about this particular case study, Australians frogs calling for our help, um, you know, the biodiversity of the frog ecosystem really is a keen indicator of, just as the, you know, the, the slides mentioned, the canary in the coal mine around indicating the health of our environment. Um, I think what else is really interesting about this particular case study, it was a relatively simple solution that was able to scale through pretty widely available technology and capability that could gather masses, massive amounts of data that then people could interpret and act on. Um, and I make this point because it's interesting to start to think about, you know, given the problems that you want to solve against the, you know, the issues that you think are important, you have access to so much that, you know, even free can make such a big impact. For example, I was living in New York during the, um, the hurricane that shut down power for quite some time, um, you know, and, and, and decimated communities out, you know, at the, at the tip of Long Island. And uh, a woman that I was working with, you know, and one of the biggest issues they were facing was how could they get supplies to all of these people? You know, and, and, and she came up with a really ingenious and very simple solution, which was leveraging the registry on Amazon, you know, things that you would use for like a wedding or a baby shower type registry to actually fill it with the supplies that the nonprofits needed to get to the people in need out in Long Island. It was incredibly effective. She had a huge impact, cost nothing, using a tool that, you know, hadn't been available not even, you know, 10 years ago. So I think, um, you know, the one thing that, that I would encourage you to think about following this is really thinking about, you know, issues that you are, are charged by, whether it be climate change, whether it be homelessness, whether it be something else, you know, and starting to think about who is being impacted by that, what you need, how you can help, and then quickly mapping it to, okay, well, what tools do I have at my disposal? And I would include with that, what partnerships might I be able to lean on, whether it's, and don't be shy, looking to a corporate, a corporate partner. Um, many of these large corporations do have programs like the um, World Community Grid and like the you know, Call for Code programs that I talked about that IBM, just a couple of examples of what IBM's got going, but every major corporation, startup or otherwise, generally has something like that you can tap into, small businesses, other like-minded folks that you can meet through various channels in your local communities to start to think about, you know, the challenges and the problems you want to solve, the needs that the people have that you're solving for, and then the new tools that you actually have access to, um, technology and otherwise, to, to make those impacts. You know, and, and, and I think the biggest, you know, if you're thinking about innovation and entrepreneurship, for me, one of the bigness, you gotta start with the why, but I think very quickly you gotta get to the who. And then from there, you can start to think about how you can help, you know, and the ways that you can make an impact. And thank you for bearing with the microphone. <laughs> and the video is not good.